All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this is I'm Richard. I use he him pronouns and uh, uh, welcome to Devil in the Details, micro settings and RPG design. Um, I'm here with a great group of people. Like I said, I'm Richard Duane. I develop Barrow Keep and Moodle and Roosevelt Moonlight on Roseville Beach and uh, Chronicles of the Space Jammer and Dark Designs and Vertigrees. And I'm here with a great group of designers. So I'm going to let introduce themselves and I'm going to start with Pam. Pam. Hi, I'm Pam Pumsalan, also known as the Dovetailer. I have been on a lot of projects as of late, but my main project is actually Sundo, uh, powered by the Apocalypse game about psychopomps and death. Uh, I am, I guess, somebody who comes from the, well, I am somebody from the Philippines, and I'm kind of the spokesperson of RPGC, I guess, but like, we really don't like that term, by the way. But like, yes, I am the hype person for that, and if you want to talk about RPGC, you'll see me yelling about it a lot. So that's me. And just for people who don't know the acronym, what does RPG stand for? Oh, uh, RPGC is RPG Southeast Asia. Uh, Zedek is also a part of it, and we try very, very hard to go like, hello, we are RPGC. Please don't speak for us. We have a lot to say. Love you. So that's generally how we do things. And Zedek, that was kind of an organic chance to like okay. over to you. Like, I'll inter like introduce yourself next. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Zedek Siu. Uh, he him. Um, I I write RPG adventures and zines. I guess uh, I made Lawn Song of the Bachelor, and with an uh, artist uh, Macau, I I make uh, zines under. A, uh, in a series called The Thousand Thousand Islands, uh, which is uh, uh, Southeast Asian inspired, uh, even though the, the term itself, the umbrella term, is so contested. Uh, but yes, moving on. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll now go over to Brian. Uh, hey, I'm uh, Brian Yaksha, he, they. Uh, I wrote uh, any nominated zine called Raquel. I, uh, Working on Brinkwood, which is a cool blades in the dark anti fascist game. And I'm currently editing Pretrescence Regnant for Morkborg. For Morkborg, or however you say that. Uh, yeah, just a general workhorse when it comes to research based writing. Fantastic. And then Amanda. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm uh, Amanda, Amanda Frank. I made uh, the zine called You Got a Job on a Garbage Barge, uh, which uh, Zedek wrote some amazing stuff for. I'm also an illustrator. Uh, I do um, illustrations for Codex Zine and a bunch of other projects, some of which haven't been released yet, but um, I'm working on art like 100% of the time lately. So, Fantastic, fantastic. All right. So I just want to kind of jump in with kind of our first big sort of discussion topic. Um, what is a micro setting? And I think small settings were something that sort of opened up RPG design for me and sort of made something I wanted to do, something that was very accessible um, and sort of gave, helped me find a place. What are, what is a micro setting? To you, what is what why what, what distinguishes a micro setting from just a, a, a more broad setting in an RPG? And I can call on people, but uh um I I have an answer to that. Yes. And it's sort of a so a micro setting is filling in all those things that you don't normally get in a product because a product seems to not want you to have full utility of it. It's modular content that is tailored to a tone that has enough utility that you can strip away any named elements that you don't need to use in it for something you would rather run, but it's focused enough or it's a toolkit designed for a specificity of purpose that actually celebrates the material it's talking about by being closer to it than what other settings or more generic products will allow. That's what I think about it. Most of my answers are a little contentious. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, totally, yeah, I totally agree with that. But uh, Anna will go ahead. <laughs> uh, I totally agree with that, too. Um, one of the things I really like about a micro setting is the idea that this is a usable, like, modular 
bit of like stuff and you can put it in anywhere um you can just grab this and like suddenly you have like the underground to your city or you have uh like a place that you can go to within a larger world that can contain anything else that happens to be there already i also like the idea that micro settings are closer to the very um as of yet undefined gameable lore, because it's something that people like to toss around, but they don't really like to define it. It was one of the reasons why uh, a few months ago I tried to make a thread about it. And rather than give a singular definition, I was like, hey, what do you think gameable lore is? Because like a micro setting presupposes that you have a microscope, you have some sort of focus, and you get all the tiny little things in it. So, and people can just pick out what they notice, because if you look at, let's say, a painting at a certain distance, you see the hole. If you, come, if you come up close, though, you might see details that you would have otherwise missed. And whether or not you focus on that or move on to another piece of the puzzle or painting is up to you. And that's the beauty of it, rather than it being confusing. So, Can I, can I offer kind of like a, a parallel but different sort of definition? I think... Uh, for when I think about micro settings, I always think about um, it's it's a setting that doesn't tell you that this is what it is. Um, so it's a like a, I will get it. I'm sure we'll get into it later. But really, the genesis of this idea for me, and the reason why I like the mode so much, is because it's a intrinsically subjective uh, set of things. It doesn't try to present an encyclopedia. Uh, which is why I find it useful as a tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Does anybody want to come back to anything before I ask the next question? But um, so th the, I think the second question was sort of inspired by something Zedek initially said when we first just started discussing this panel. But I think Brian, definitely you and Pam have, and, and Amanda have all hit on things sort of around this. Is that um, and then that micro settings frequently feel uh, very concrete and very real, even though they're sort of modular and they they can be picked up from one place and kind of put down another place. Brian, you mentioned changing names and 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 sort of you know filing off rough edges to, to kind of get them to fit. Yeah. Um, but uh, what what is it about micro settings um, that makes things feel so concrete and real. Uh, and I think that's something that a lot of us have experienced. Um, certainly, having gotten to play Garbage Barge, it is it is a distinctive, very real, very concrete setting. It has a lot of people and things in it that are super compelling and have lots of... Uh, and, uh, but uh, but uh, sort of what is it about micro settings that sort of does that for you or for us as designers? Um. Well, one thing that I think works really well on the small scale is that, uh, like when I'm writing, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking like pretty much anything that I'm going to end up making is going to have the same characteristic. Uh, it's uh, really specific to me personally. It's like specific things that I know about in my world, even though I've moved them to a more fantastic setting. And the idea is that I can I can put all that stuff in there. And then somebody who I don't even know and have never met can kind of access all of that stuff that I know about. Uh, and that's really exciting to me as like a creative person. So if I play somebody else's micro setting, like it's like I get to go inside of their brain and see all of the stuff that they know about very specifically. Uh, and I think that if you're designing on this like a huge world building scale, you never get to those details. I, 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 I really agree with that. I think it also touches what Brian was saying, which is the specificity of tone. Uh, and that comes from your uh, uh, creator's uh, sort of personal obsessions. Uh, and because of the scope of it, it's, um, it, it's not feasible to have that amount of care or attention or, or chase the rabbit down that hole if you're doing a, if you're doing a be-all and end also the subjectivity of the and the scope of the micro setting is the reason why it feels concrete. Um, that's, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. I think, think also, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, I think, 
I think also that like one of the reasons why, at least on a personal level, I like to gravitate towards micro settings and smaller focus uh, foci is because when I look at large RPGs, I rarely see myself or even my country or even the beginnings of my country in any of the pages. Like it's just not there. So uh, and the the same could be said for any marginalized group or any group that is otherwise painted in broad strokes and left to the wayside. So what my friends and I used to talk about when we when we played D&D for example is that okay so like great what about the castle guards that you guys always end up killing like what's what's their life what's their routine so you you start with very small questions and then you do end up kind of chasing it to some kind of logical point but that logical point is not actually logical in the binary sense it's very emotional what interested you what interested your yeah. players, yeah. right? Yeah. And what can you make a small game out of in that like little sphere? What could you, what could you, what more could you talk about? And how could you show people a, a perspective that matters, that A, matters a lot to you, B, is very different, and yet C, could still be plausibly coached in a larger world with larger concerns that you can easily generalize versus like a, 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 a small, tiny sphere of something that has so much uh, vibrancy and possibility to it. So that's that's how I like to design uh, micro settings on my end. Uh, I would say the sort of three main qualities that make a micro setting feel more real is that it has a clarity of purpose in what it is doing, which is sadly not something you see in a lot of greater campaign settings, which you think would be in there because that's going to guide play more than most anything else, and a real celebration of the material. I've read enough, here's what it's like to climb a mountain, but it gives me absolutely none of the emotional thrills of climbing a, a mountain or the horrors and fears. I don't need the mechanics for how many toes I'm going to lose a night unless that's a funny little aside. I need to have like the actual, like, what am I, you know, what? What am I succumbing to mentally when I start doing like paradoxical undressing, things like that? And I think most of all, what you find when you have a good micro setting, or at the very least, what you find in micro settings rather than larger settings, macro settings, whatever you want to call it, is uh, there's a term in video games called a vertical slice, where you're getting something from like an hour or two into the game where you get to see how everything's unfolding. And it's like, I don't need to know all the rules to how this was set up. This feels lived in. This feels organic. I'm witnessing a moment and it feels correct rather than like, it's not so much scaffolding as it is just sort of an organic growth that you can really sort of find the integrity in. I think people wanted to add about sort of those sort of concrete details because I have a few points I wanted to dig in on, but I, I, I don't want to like, cut anybody off. If you've got something you want to jump in on. Um, Pam, here and in our previous conversations, you had talked a lot about um, really digging in to sort of those daily life details in micro settings um, and really like thinking about the guard's life and, and, and what is, what is daily, how does daily life unfold in this space? Um, and I think in macro settings, when people try to do those things, they just come across as very affected and silly. But I, I feel like in micro settings, there's something different. Uh, that that finding out those very concrete details about micro settings. Do you could would how would you like to how would you sort of talk to people about sort of like what is gameable lore about daily life? How do you make daily life gameable? I guess I guess that's try, what I'm trying to get to. That's the question I'm just trying to hit. Um. The, the thing, the essence that I understand to be gameable lore is that it must be useful to you. And that which is useful must be personal. So it would presuppose then that if you're going to do a micro setting, you should really do a micro setting about what you know. And I use quotations mm -hmm. of what you know generally because we have to understand the, the idea of writing what you know is also very Western and or colonialized, right? So... Mm -hmm. It, my own personal process, at least, when it comes to uh, writing anything that focuses a, like a pinpoint perspective on something, is um, what am I trying to reclaim here, for example? What is missing from the larger picture? And what is that one thing in the larger picture 
that seems intriguing, seems important, but also seems to be glossed over, objectified, and ignored. So, like it, in a, in a city, for example, in fantasy settings, let's go back to the castle guard here. That you have a city means that you must have some sort of law enforcement, and when you have the law enforcement, you have the ideological state, so I'm going to go like totally geek, but like ideological state apparatus of the idea of the institution and that it is, it's, it's an authority. It has a, it gives you a certain ideology behind it. It has, it has an agenda basically that not even the participants would know about, but you also have the concrete reality of it is a paying job uh, and it provides, it's supposed to provide some sort of security and it, is also something that I think that a lot of people in the in the castle guard uh, barracks must think about or deliberately ignore. So then, those are so many questions that you could take, explore, ignore, re rehash, revise, uh, and completely redo. And like the other example I have for that is is queerness. Uh, the thing that I always hear about queerness is that it is historically inaccurate for me to have been a Katipunera in the Philippines in 1800s. So why do I why do I bring that up? Because the 1800s is the revolutionary period of my country, and the macro setting of a Katipunan revolution in the Philippines will tell you one thing: there were great men that created this revolution. However, in my micro setting of a small town in a province called Batangas, um, I learned that my ancestor was a woman who used to carry guns under her coat and on her boat. That is a micro-setting moment. So you have great men making history, great men doing this, and great men bringing freedom. But then you also have my, my ancestor like basically going, fuck the Spanish, without actually saying it, being very sweet, giving, giving alms to the poor, and pandering with the church, while also literally bringing in guns for... Uh, through the ships. So like uh, macro setting, then micro setting. That one personal, realistic detail where if you thought about it, it could happen. And it, that is the area of play, the area between what we understand to be the reality and what could actually physically, concretely be possible and is interesting to us. I, 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 I really like the framework of the macro setting as equivalent to the nationalist uh, dream and the micro setting as an opposition or standing as a, as a reaction or an altern, alternate uh, narrative to that, which is which I find really useful. Uh, yeah, like sort of delving into you know, little, little things like discovering uh, who your grandmother was, uh, what life was like for her versus what she would. See, um, what your uncles would tell her about what her life was like, uh, because they've they've absorbed this national, uh, this macro setting of the national idea. Um, so yeah, like that. I just really like that frame. Mm -hmm. Anything else on that? Um, the thing that like that story about the uh, your grandmother was so fascinating, and. It, I think that that sort of thing is like in any country, the the big like story of history, which is what you might end up getting in a game that has a big setting. Um, it doesn't ever allow room for stuff like that, stuff that doesn't fit the larger narrative. Um, and if you are somebody who's playing a game and you even want to put that in, you end up kind of finding yourself using stereotypes. So if you've got those castle guards and maybe it's in a landscape that you're not familiar with, you you just you do the first thing you think of as like a the game runner, the DM or whatever. And if you have a micro setting that gives you these characters and that tells you what the possibilities in whatever this landscape is that might go against what you would expect at first, that's really powerful. Um, I, I think following on to what you're saying, like the idea of like back to sort of, uh, uh, sort of archetypal thing that you have in your mind. Uh, also, like just following on to like what Pam was saying about the sort of the central narrative, the, the, the main narrative of history or whatever it is. It's like the, uh, the reason why I love Microsoft and the reason why, like, for example, like 
for a thousand thousand islands we are in intentionally writing it and making it the way we are making it is that there is no cent there is no macro setting there is no center to react to uh one because it kind of accurately or it feels like we are reflecting what uh our inspirational geography is like more uh but also it it sort of like helps to sort of deal with this idea of like, oh, I'm going to fall back to the archetypal or the, because there is no, uh, there would be no, there, there is no campaign setting that you are writing, that you're attaching into your, there, there is only, uh, we, 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 we were sort of floating this idea where it would only, our Thousand Thousand Islands project would only be these zines and the way you lay out the map would be just to fling it on the floor. And all these separate zines. There'll be no uh, city from which the, everybody would go to or, or go to uh, or leave from. Um, yeah. So if everyone's if if everyone's cool with it, I'd like to sort of kind of I think step back to something that's been that's been hit on. Uh, and talk a little bit about, uh, and, and I, my, my touchstone for this is queerness. I feel like in a macro setting, you will never see queerness in a macro setting. Um, like until you, until you dig down, until you drill down and see the and see all the details, you just never see queerness. Yeah. And I know the, that, yeah. Yeah, go the ahead, Pam, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, it's, it's okay. The only time that you're gonna see queerness in a macro setting is if the designer deliberately made the entire world queer. Uh, right. Like thir thirsty sword lesbians is li it's literally the title thirsty sword lesbians. Mm -hmm. So this is a queer world um, and like Navathim's End, which is a P two B a game I'm working on with my partner. Uh, we are very very queer about it, but like that's the mm -hmm. only time you're going to see it in a macro setting. And the annoying part, at least for me, is that because the world is straight, I'm going to have to explain why my world is queer. Um, more often than not, like usually, sometimes I will literally go in my game. Okay, fuck it, it's queer. Get over it. But other times, I'm going to take the time to go. Okay, it's because it's like this. Because politics are like that. Blah, 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 right. But yeah, you're right. Unless you make it queer and you state that it's queer for your audience in one way or another, explicitly or implicitly, you just won't see it. Right. Uh, and I know that we've talked about other experiences of marginalization really kind of come to the fore diversity comes to the fore in a micro setting what how does you know and I, I and i think some of the answers are obvious but i'd love to hear what you have to say about sort of how mike you know drilling down getting very specific opens up diverse experiences especially experience of marginalization um in a, in a in a setting so you know when you when you have this when you have this massive world guide it's like one group of people live over here and this group of people live over here uh, but when you go micro something opens up so i um, i would like to start sorry i cut you off sorry oh no 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 that was i was setting you guys up so you you take over <laughs> well i i was i was going to say that um the the interesting thing about writing such a subjective or using such a subjective frame of writing a thing is that, uh, or rather in my own personal experience, the, I feel like writing a micro setting forces you to think about uh, where and who you are. Um, I mean, by, by that I mean the sort of perspective of the, of the, of the, of the person or the people doing the looking and describing in, in the text. Uh, because there's always somebody doing the looking and describing. So by um, uh, because it's not trying to uh, do a sort of uh, uh, omniscient uh, third, third person author perspective, which is a lie anyway, because that always protects the sort of metropole. Um, you you kind of get so like for me writing a micro setting is always called in the sense that it always forces you to think who's doing the looking at this people or at this place and how that how is the place uh or the people being described uh, feeling and or responding to being described 
uh, yeah, so that's that's really the kind of the, where the where I think it's it makes sort of thinking about marginalizations and also relationships between the marginalized and marginalizing uh, really become obvious, at least in the creating of, of these settings. Yeah. So uh, that was a very like nice and sensitive, empathetic answer. I do it out of spite because I've had so many people throughout. I got out in high school, second year of high school. And there are not lockers enough for me to shove these bigots into and make them fit. So it's like, yeah, I'm going to have people that look like me and do the things that I enjoy and, you know, things like that. And if you don't enjoy that, well, you can evaluate on that, that on your own or you can come to me and I'll be like, I'm sorry you don't enjoy that. Here are some very easy ways you can subvert that if you need to. Or you can, you know, come at me and I can be like, wow, so you decided you wanted to make me a stranger your enemy. What a strange thing for you to do to a stranger. I don't know. I think that radicalization early on is pretty much why I write things the way I write. And had I known the greater liberties and freedoms to come, you know, with age and knowledge and wisdom and all that, probably would have written myself to be a lot more overtly queer from the get-go. But uh, apparently the subtlety was enough to have people say, well, this might upset our bigoted market share, so can we make it ambiguous? I, I do not- agree. Mm. Yeah, I, I do agree, though, that, like, okay, I don't, again, speaking only for you and me and other spite beasts, but, like, the fact that we can even articulate this means that we have come a very long way. Right, that you can distill your design somehow, even even if it doesn't seem entirely articulate, that you've presented some sort of perspective to it. Like I'm, uh, I only sound sweet, I guess, when I'm talking about this because I've rehearsed it a lot, and it's in panels like this that I can articulate why my rage level is like this, but my design is like that, and how did it? How do those two relate? Like they are interconnected, so um, it might. I, I don't know whether it even sounds sweet. I've been told it does until like the words come in. Yeah. But either way, you know, uh, I can say fuck colonialism and support queer people, many different shades. Uh, and I try to do that in my design as much as possible uh, because I can't help it. Like this is how the world has pegged me. So how do I recenter myself? And how do I insist mm. that your centers are wrong? Right, there are multiple centers here, and there should be, and they must be recognized. And having hundreds upon hundreds of micro settings is one very creative and interesting way of doing it. So, every place is a center. Uh, because, uh, yes, fuck, fuck colonialism, and also fuck, because, because uh, where, I, where I live, it's like I've been marginalized uh, and sort of like. Op- Basically op- op- oppressed in many different ways, but also being being middle class in a sort of middle lower middle class. You know, you get you get marginalized by by the aristocrats in the city, and but also you as as a person who's living here and even in rural Southeast Asia are 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 oppressing. Uh, for example, Malaysia uh, Malaysia has a lot gets a lot of uh, very poorly compensate the labor and basically uh, in slave conditions uh, from our neighbors, uh, the Philippines, Indonesia. Um, so yeah, um, fuck colonialism for, and, and also fuck my own colonialist uh, in complicity. Uh, um, so I think, Amanda, did you have something you wanted to add or I don't want to cut you off or... Before I move on. Uh, yeah, just really quickly, I think that there's you get you get the, the gift that you get as someone who's like an indie designer or writer is that um you don't have to change your stuff to please like some big boring corporation. Um so I don't know, even if we don't have the uh we don't have like a huge team to make an enormous 
this like you know 70 page book that's totally illustrated the stuff that we get to make it's maybe smaller but it's way more interesting and it's way cooler and it's totally different from the big stuff that's out yeah you're not building your house on rented land i think is the weird phrase mm -hmm. yeah i think it comes back to kind of what i wanted next to talk about is something that I've seen that several of you have brought up and I've heard several of you talk about um, here and elsewhere is centering yourself in developing a micro setting and centering your own experience and sort of starting from spaces that you ha inhabit, even if they're, you know, fictionalized versions of spaces you inhabit. Um, a few people called me out um, as a huge giant nerd for 90s series fiction when I started working on Barrow Keep and I am proud of that. Um, uh, but, uh, but sort of inhabiting spaces, uh, or, or starting from spaces you inhabit when you begin working on a micro setting in ways that you, are harder to do when you're doing a macro setting, because it's hard to really bring out, uh, identity and personality. What has been y'all's experience, um, with sort of bringing yourself and sort of, you know, I, I, you know, it's, sometimes in in hex crawls, people start about like just start with one hex and sort of build up from there. And I feel like in a in a sense, you know, micro settings are a lot about building out from around yourself and your own experiences and your own passions and interests. So, what has been your experience for sort of like starting from there? What is what has that been like for you? Um, or am I am I completely off base? So I'll let y'all tell me. So uh, everything I write is about shame and sorrow and the catalyst of both is often inconsequential but ultimately it leads to a fear of vulnerability and that's how you get to like the core of sorry there's a ghost in pam's frame uh that's how you get to like the core of human empathy so like when i wrote raquel the goal was you're not playing good people that is overtly the text you are bad people sent to a bad place because nobody wants you around anymore. You, your backstory only matters as much as you want it to because here's your blank slate. But you are, by the text of who you were, a bad person. Whether or not you as a player choose to continue to follow these patterns is up to you. But you may gain some catharsis in seeking to subvert the people who have ruined your life, except that person may be yourself. Uh, I was pointed out to me yesterday by Harrison Swift that I wrote a zine which is the antithesis of this, and it's all about sort of the fear and just sort of the, not the fear, the sadness of returning home to a place that you've been away from for any amount of time and just realizing People have changed. You don't really have control over anyone in your life. And like that's scary in the way that aging is scary. This realization of like you, you thought you were the center of the universe as a child and maybe as a teenager, but it slowly extrapolates and expands. And while people may come to celebrate you for what you've done, you're ultimately inconsequential, just like everyone else. And how you choose to react to this with, you know, sort of a nihilist situation is ultimately on you. And I think that's a useful lens that is rarely explored in settings because you want to be a hero rather than, you know, just some person who's got some issues. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, my philosophy. I think if I like, it's, a, it's good that you answered it first, Brian, because I was like, holy shit, I have to talk about what my common themes are, I have no idea. But <laughs> I think that generally, um, if I were to try, it would definitely be, I've noticed that a lot of my games deal with memory. And I think that is because memory, memory loss, memory reclamation, and actually sacrificing memories. Because memory for a woman is also identity. And it is also something that people will force upon you here. They will gaslight you and say things like you did not remember it correctly. Uh, or they will insist that something in your memory works to their favor when it really doesn't work at all for you. So the constant exercise of wrestling with memory and even letting memory power you 
is is something that I like exploring because memory can be a personal act, and then you have the collectivist uh, act of several people mem memorizing something or remembering something very personal to them, and then you have a nation's memory, or you have a city's memory, or you have a concept's memory. And uh, one thing that I really liked from my own studies before was in memory studies, they were talking a lot about how um, the layers of memory are like sediments. And like, each layer has something different for you. So I guess, I, I think I, I, I don't have the English word for it, but it's basically to make himai in Tagalog would mean like you kind of just sift through the sand and you dig up things. And sometimes it's covered in the sand. Other times you can shake it off and you'll be fine. Other, other times, because it's been so long, you're never actually going to know what its original form was like. So uh, I think if I had to like sum it to that one thing for me in game design, it's really memory and uh, playing with that and, and also defining that for myself and insisting that this is my perspective and you cannot take it away from me. The compost of me memory. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cat. Hey, cat. cat. <laughs> That's such a big cat. <laughs> yes, I was gonna say it's a very large looking cat. I, I got him in the trash. Oh wow! Hidden, which is where I got most of my um my stuff and most of my ideas. Uh, and I guess if I was gonna talk about um like my the way I think about game design, it's like I have the, the world that I know that I live in, um, which is crumbling visibly all around. And so I like I took that and I thought, can I what happens if I if I kind of turn that up as far as it goes, and is it still possible to live in that world? Like is it still possible to have like art and companionship and friends and stuff? Um, and I think that anyone who is trying to write a game, they could look at the world that they live in and they could um, they could do the same thing. Like what happens if it goes really far this way? Or if I start another game, I could again like look at the like, you know, my neighborhood or my friends or the stuff that's happened to me in the past and say, well what if I push it in this different direction? Then what happens? But it's still really grounded in my own reality and i think that's really important because it makes things really easy for me because i just like you're writing that stuff down and you just know how it'll be and how it'll look i i i, I relate to actually everything everybody's been saying so far uh about where sort of like if i were to answer this sort of initial question like where did, where did the places my work comes from like the, the settings that I write come from is really just from stuff around. Like um, I was, I was actually going to take the title uh, because I was thinking about the title of our panel, uh, "Devil in the Details," and it occurred to me this morning while I was thinking about it that I grew up learning that uh, Shiva and Kali were satanic demons uh, because I was brought up in this sort of um, uh, very American influenced uh, like Christian sort of Presbyterian church uh, where you know you speak in tongues and things like that and you you grow up knowing that the 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 sort of gods that your uh, classmates uh, worshipped were demons um, and I think like thinking about that and the fact that, that um, really informs like what, I'm, what I've been trying to do ever since, sort of writing about, writing about place, writing about returning home, writing about the, the lack of memory or the compost of memory. Um, and uh, like, uh, because Amanda said something about li li living in a, a garbage reality or the, uh, the, the true reality of trash. And my, my hometown politics is kind of like that because there are a lot of, there are a lot of buildings in our town which was which were built in the nineties during the big boom of uh, Asia and then the crash of uh, so like there are all these wastelands uh, and all, when I was growing up it was always about how do I get out of this of this context into a more aspirational context which was uh, the West the U S or the U K in, in this Malaysian country. And sort of writing, writing the work I write now is about 
how do I live here in this geography? Uh, how do I make this geography meaningful to me? And if people can see that it's uh, it's a bonus, and I think I think people can, and that's the strength of the of the of the frame of the micro setting. Mm. So yeah. So I don't want to curtail anybody's ability to answer this question. Mm. If you want to explore it more, but it is a, a twenty minute time. Left Thanks, Becky. The panel. Um, I just wanted to check. Uh, I think I think the last question I had before we switch over to audience questions is I know that for a lot of us, not exclusively, but for a lot of us, we tend to work really heavily on setting and not so much on system. Um, I think for a lot of us, setting is the system. Like setting creates the the fictional constraints of the game, uh, and I know that's not that's not exclusive. And I I actually uh, embarrassingly don't know what projects everybody is planning and working on in the background. So if I I'm going to be really embarrassed if everybody on the call except for me is really planning a, like a, a releasing a complex system in, or a simple <laughs> system in the next in the next few days. Um, it's, a, it's okay. I love you, but yes, I am planning on on screwing with a system. Uh, like, yeah. Because like oh okay I always screw with the system by the way hi I'm gay but like basically um, uh, the the idea for me is it's nice how you said story is setting and setting a system and that's mm -hmm. how it's kind of blended in my head I can only again speak for myself but like the idea that I'm screwing with the system mm -hmm. is that like people give you a particular kind of system and they insist that it is the only system that you should be using so my usual way is like okay how do I break it. How do I add other things that matter to me? And at the end of the day, uh, for me anyway, the system matters argument is so yesterday. Do what you want with it, mm -hmm. right? Whether you have it or not, just if somebody out there is going to want to play it, and if that only person that wants to play it is you, then great. Like, who cares, right? Uh, as long as it's fun. So, uh, yeah, that's my like quick aside to yes, I am trying to make something i don't know when it's going to happen but it will so uh i have been personally and morally wronged by many system creators so i see fit to butcher <laughs> their work to support my aims and cultivate it towards a more proper tone which better supports what it is i'm working on but it's also sort of easy enough that anyone can use it for anything because i swear i will not design for fifth edition it is too much I've done it twice for people and never again, unless they pay I just, me very well. I find I find I find systems of fifth edition and above complexity just I don't know how to prep for them. So that's that's the reason why I don't make stuff. There's so way. many frameworks that use the same basic notations of all these cumbersome systems that it's like yeah no I could just design it for this basic probability ratio and file off any branding mm -hmm. but uh some people god some people are just like hey i see you made this thing that wouldn't fit at all in fifth edition have you designed it for fifth edition i will only purchase it if it's for that and i just i cannot abide these people i think that was every third question i got on barakeep during the kickstarter but are you gonna <laughs> do something for fifth edition it's so often and it's just like why play anything easier I mean, anything you wanted to add okay oh, yeah. i'm sorry I'm, 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 it's okay I'm, uh conversely i was gonna say that islands of sina una was designed specifically for dungeons and dragons fifth edition and the reason behind that was really lucia and joshua wanted to see how it could be if they made a Dungeons and Dragons that represents us as best as possible. That was a challenge and it involved a lot of emotional labor and a lot of very hard mathematics that I'm happy to say I was not involved in at all. So yay. But like overall, uh, they made it as it is, therefore it exists. And nobody can gainsay you anymore on what it should be mm -hmm. and what it shouldn't be. So like honestly, mm -hmm. if you want to design for it, go ahead. If you don't want to design for it, but you're angry, fuck off. It, like you're not the one who did it. You're not the one who did the hard work. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was the one ideating spells, uh, a lot of them, because they were like, Pam, we need help. We have like 30 spells to do. And I was like, uh, I can't do mechanics. 
but they were like, that's okay, just come up with the idea. And like the hard duty had to do the actual ideation of the mechanics, right? Just be like, but what if moonlight tattoos? Because they're pretty, right? Like, and that was already a redo of that. So it, it broke Joshua's heart, I think, to hear people say, you should have done it in PTBA. And my only oh, really? like, oh, right, God, or, yeah. right. And I'm just yeah. like, I don't, you're not the one who designed it. Like, where did, okay. Where, where do you think those comments come from? Um, I think, okay, that is an entire panel. Uh, <laughs> and um, I think that uh, it will be a panel of me spitting a lot of anger and spite at a lot of people. people I apologize. Who want to do the prep work for them. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. Basically, because I don't think a lot of people understand how difficult it is to design. Every design is personal. Even if you're hired mm -hmm. by a big company, you put yourself into it and it sucks. More often than not, it sucks. Even when you care about mm -hmm. the project, it hurts. And it, for me, people who make those comments are people who have not experienced the hard, constant work or think that because they have, it justifies them oppressing you. Mm -hmm. So it's one or the other. You haven't done shit or you have, but you've turned it into a point of arrogance of which there is actually no leg to stand on. So, yeah. I know we're coming up in about 15 minutes to time. Uh, so I wanted to give Mickey a chance to let us know if there's audience questions, but I want then if, if, if we're still gathering audience questions, we can sort of make sure we have more time we to talk about that. We have quite a few more audience questions than we'll ever be able to get to, but um, okay. still, I'd I don't want to curtail your ability to talk about the things that you are here to talk about. So yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So do people have anything they want to jump in on on that topic before we? Uh, Brian, I, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I, I guess I have a last point to pretty much do. So I did work on a fifth edition Vedic Indian inspired. I personally prefer pre Vedic era because it's been so overdone, and people, specifically white American audiences, like ah, caste system. That's simple. It's not. It's very complex and very interesting. Oh, I can account for my own personal lineage in that, but that's an aside. Uh, with uh, Ben Jin, and I have no idea when it's going to be published, but I did it for shares, and I wrote some really friggin' heavy metal takes on Hinduism from my background with, you know, Bhadravi Shaktiism and Gnosticism and Satanism and all that fun stuff, and really hope that gets published soon because I'd love to move on to doing my own thing without worried about accidentally duplicating material. That's all I had to say, just because yeah. I'm brought up. <laughs> Amanda, I didn't want to cut you off if you had anything to add to that one. So before, I think we are ready to move on to audience questions. Okay, I will start uh, with uh, the first audience question. And you okay. just cut out, Mickey, sorry. Sorry, here, I'm back. Okay. Uh, okay, so when you're when writing multiple micro settings over time, do you have any thoughts on how they might interact? As an example, a thousand thousand islands has various settings that refer to each other in an almost Easter egg kind of a way. Uh, they don't necessarily require knowledge of each other, but they do seem to have strings and, and references in between them. Is that something that you design with intent? Uh, and, and, and is that... Uh, I mean, how do you feel about that kind of thing? Um, I guess I'll take this. Uh, the, the way that Thousand Thousand Islands is made is that typically uh, Mang Tao the artist makes images. And uh, he, because, you know, the, the, the Easter egg thing is because when you're working on a thing that you're really tired uh, working on, it's fun to do little things for yourself. So really that's... That's where all the link linkages happen. Uh, more intentionally, though, and more seriously, um, uh, the, these things develop organically uh, and are baked into the writing of it. So the, 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 the thing about writing from a subjective space also is that you can refer, is that the, a, a thing is concrete by what it relates to even though the re what it relates to, that there's no information beyond the relationship. Uh, so the, the first zine we ever wrote had references to things that we didn't know about until we wrote them later. Um, and I think the strength of, of, of creating in this way is that uh, those linkages 
are present already. You don't really have to plan for them, or that's what I found in, in, in practice. Um, also, the, another thing I just want to add to that is that the linkage, because of the, of the specificity of the project, it, it's intentional that some of these linkages will contradict each other uh, because um, perspective is contradictory. Okay, great. Does anybody else want to chime in on that one? I was gonna. The only thing I was gonna add is, is the, as I as I sort of build out, flesh out the world of Bear Keep, I've always thought of it as a set of micro settings, um, and I think that uh, looking at the ways those interact with and inform each other um, is really um, has just been has been really powerful and has been very much enabled by kind of moving things out of a a standard you know YA fantasy world into something a slightly more steampunky. Because then I don't have to worry about I don't have to worry about everything that's in between two points on the map uh, until we start trying to figure out sort of like so what does train travel leave out? Um, so what does train travel skip over? Um, and then we can but I can ask that at, at specific points in specific ways. Um, so I think that that was the only thing I wanted to to add. But otherwise, I feel like that's what I'm aiming for is very much what Zedek you said that people can throw the zine based setting on the ground and sort of piece it together in the way they the way they like. Um, but yeah. Mickey, back. Sorry. Okay. Um, this is a question I think is gonna be really good. Um, in what ways do you think that micro setting design concepts that you've been talking about might be able to intersect with games that are designed with like a collaborative setting creation? type motif like an apocalypse world or a monster hearts or those kinds of things where they where you create setting at the table so uh i uh my, my uh raquel products are pretty much built for that because ultimately i find that big sweeping campaigns that travel the world are never satisfying because the world does not feel like a place i would rather wherever whatever small region you're in feels like a place with just layers upon layers of interesting things that you may or may not ever get to interact with. But it's not, you know, the state of the God King's religion 10,000 leagues away, which will never matter. It's the problem that's, you know, two leagues away from where you currently are, which will slowly become more and more of a problem depending on who's backing who. But I also am well aware that my products are based entirely around conflicts and just the escalation of things getting worse and worse because people are terrible. So that's my thoughts on that. Huh. Well, generally, I just like showing people if I was a, whenever I do design projects that are meant to fit into like a larger thing or collaborative storytelling, I like trying to make designs that will help you answer uh, what is missing here and what gaps can you fill in? Uh, because there will always be gaps. No matter what you do, there, there's no way that you can completely fill in a product. And that's the beauty, I think, of a lot of tabletop RPGs, because you're meant to actually fill in the gaps and dwell in it. Uh, now, that, at least that's that it is in theory, if you want to be very romantic about it. But like at the end of the day, uh, you could also be very spiteful about it and go like, I will literally play this character because I want to. It doesn't matter if it makes sense. It doesn't have to make sense. Uh, so it's that, that's how I'd see it when it comes to designing that way. Anyone else on that one? Sorry, Amanda, it looks like you were. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've found myself doing now that I'm running games like only online um, is is designing games that have a lot of really specific opportunities for a player to say what it is they want out of the world. Um, because that works really well with the kind of like the bad situation of playing an RPG on Zoom where you have to like specifically ask all of your players what they want to do at every given moment. Um, so I've kind of started designing for that in a way where there's maybe not they're maybe not deciding all of the like shape of the world they're in, but there's a lot of places where they get to make very specific decisions and tell the story in that area. And then I take those decisions and for the next session, like figure out what they have done. I have a follow-on question for the panel. 
about this thing. Um, like, how do you balance the the thing about the really subjective view of making, creating this uh, place that feels tangible and from a very particular perspective, versus um, because I I get a lo- I get this question frequently like oh your zines are great but I I'm too scared to run it for my group because I don't think they'll be able to uh, portray the setting well for me that's not I, I have a hard time with this question because uh, like the thing is so loose bring your bring yourself to it uh, but there is mm-hmm. but how do you balance that because the I, I think it's the, the tone of the perspective that maybe turns people off, or I'm, I guess I'm being generous here. Uh, I, I get what you're oh, saying. Oh, go ahead, Oh, sorry. Well, I mean, I, mm-hmm. I get what you're saying because it's an issue that I've found with a lot of the times when I run a game, I will make a quick page length document of this is what you know, this is how, like, these are things you know to be normal that you believe to be true for whatever purposes. And if you are able to slap that out, most people are able to play in anything without feeling too like floaty as it were. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. they they have a a guiding line for, you know, like uh, I used to run a lot of uh, L5R to quality, but uh, it was like, hey, here's the basics of like, this is a world where ghosts and stuff are real. So if your character is a skeptic, who doesn't believe in ghosts, that means something very specific. And when you see a ghost, your reaction probably shouldn't be very Scooby-Doo, like, oh no, it's like, well, what, what is this? What is this you're pulling here? Something like that. Um, yeah, I, I guess the, the question that, the question throws me off a little bit because um, it, it really, like, that one page document was basically every game I ever ran. So the orientation, because none of my players really were, are really play, play games very often. So they're not into the sort of cultures that would have couched them for a place like Foreground Realms or whatever. So it was always, yeah. So I, I just wonder whether how you guys feel about Orienting, orientating uh, people mean, to your work. There's also very much a colonialist aspect of it, but I did try to run a very like pre-Vedic Indian type game with a bunch of white people one time, and I did not give them any sort of guiding degree to what is normal and what is not. And oh, they did not know how to deal with elephants in like that sort of whole mythic landscape concept. So. Yeah, your audience is also going to matter on that. Yeah, I I am happy you mentioned audience because my response to the question usually is, I, I do encounter it a lot, right? Especially with the games that deal with the Philippine setting. People don't feel safe playing it. But like, for me... But how they, I, they're scared of making a mistake, right? Yeah, this, yeah. but like the what I've noticed at least personally is that you have one half that is honestly scared of making a mistake because they do not want to offend. They want to learn. They want to be better. And they actually want to immerse themselves, not in a tourist fashion, but in an actual, oh, this is a different world from mine kind of fashion. And then you have the people who ask it because, frankly, they're white and fragile. And when I say white and fragile, I don't mean like, I'm not saying all white people are like that, obviously, right? But it's like, white is a matter of thinking. Even brown and black people can be thinking white and they don't know it. So how I respond to the question depends actually on the person who is asking. If they are asking in the spirit of good faith, then I will try. And if how they're not- How do you not, tell the difference? Oh, that takes practice. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a, again, another panel. You can go into it like for a really long time uh, about how to, how to deal with that. There is no set answer is the problem. Excellent. So um, in these last couple of minutes, please, all of you say one more time who you are, where you can be reached online, how we can connect with you, and what projects you're working on that we all want to grab a hold of and play. Well, I'm not muted, so I guess I'll go. 
Uh, I'm Brian Yaksha. You can find me at goatmansgoblet.com, at goatmansgoblet on Twitter, and at rakehellzine.com. I wrote uh, Rakehell. I'm still working on the sequel because I am fortune's fool and life is often miserable. Uh, doing stuff for the Melsonian Arts Council, Morkborg, Brinkwood, lots of stuff. Uh, just had a Pathfinder thing published about me writing uh, Ravithra, a sort of Hindi god, and that's all I'm going to say. So I'm talking too much. Pam, you go. Oh, uh, hi, I'm Pam. You can find me, The Dovetailer, on Twitter, Itch, and Patreon. Please support me uh, as much as possible. I'm currently knee deep in NBA land, uh, but yesterday I finished my mech and pilot setting for Gun and Singer. I will be moving on to do my Unbreakable Anthology thing. I have two NDA things on my, on my plate, so hopefully you'll see it soon. And I'm also part of the Thirsty Sword Lesbians uh, PTBA project right now. I'm kind of working on my own stuff, but uh, it's uh, got to hustle for the money right now. So find me, Dove Taylor, the Dove Taylor, Twitter, Itch, and Patreon. I can go next. I am Richard uh, Ruain, and I am uh, at ARR underscore ROO um, on pretty much everywhere except for itch because I had the great idea that I would change the name for my itch store. Um, so that is R Rook for R Rook Game Studios. Um, Rook like the, the bird that you only find in England um, or only find in Europe. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I am currently finishing up the Barrow Keep Kickstarter and sort of figuring out what's going to be in the very next zine copy of Barrow Keep. And then I'm also working on the, the next issue of Chronicles of the Space Jammer. And then keep promising that I'm going to do something for holidays again this year. Uh, I've done some holiday adventures in the past, and we'll probably do another one this year. Um, and then Amanda, tagging you next. Uh, hi, I'm Amanda. Uh, you can find me at Annabelle underscore Lee on Twitter. Um, my itch page is Amanda Lee. Uh, uh, you can get the garbage barge scene at Exalted Funeral if you want a, a paper copy. Uh, and I'm currently working on illustrations for a, a, a lot of books. Um, Codex Zine, uh, something for with Scrap Princess, is going to be out hopefully someday. And uh, um, yeah, just a lot of projects. Uh, if you follow my Twitter, you can look at them. That's it. And Zedek. Uh, uh, um, hi, Zedek. My name is Zedek Siu. I, I'm, I'm on social media on my own name. Uh, and uh, I, I co-make uh, Thousand Thousand Islands, which, is, which can be found at thousandthousandislands.com because we finally got a shop. Uh, the zines are available in PDF. Unfortunately, they're not available uh, internationally uh, in, in paper copies because of uh, post issues situation. Uh, but yeah. Excellent. Sure. Thank you all very, very much. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll wrap it up now. Um, if any of you want to go hang out uh, on the Metatopia Discord in the panel watch party room, that would be awesome. Uh, the audience members might go in there to give, maybe ask you some more questions or anything if any of you are interested and so inclined. Uh, other than that, uh, we'll wrap it now. And I hope the rest of you have a great Metatopia. Those who have panels coming up, uh, good luck with those. And uh, take care of everybody. Thanks so. Thanks so much, Mickey. Thank you, Berger. Thanks.